you were with us last week or if you watched online, we dealt with the first part of this verse last week. And those who will walk in step with this rule, peace and mercy be upon them. And it was this final benedictory statement that Paul makes that all those who will conform themselves to the pattern of belief that's in line with the cross of Christ and all that that entails, we see this in chapter 6, verse 14 to 15, when Paul says, may I never boast in anything but what? The cross of Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. Because in Christ, neither circumcision, that is Jewish identity, nor uncircumcision, that is Gentile identity, means anything but what? A new creation, right? I said last week, that's why I fundamentally would hold that the church is not Israel, it's not the new Israel, it's not the new Italy, it's not the new America, it's not any nation on earth, it is a new creation, and I guess if we want to extend the word nation ethnos out, we are an ethnos of born-again believers in Jesus Christ from every tribe, tongue, and nation to do a new thing on this earth. So Jesus has proved true when he says, I will build my church, future tense, not I will help you understand how the church has always been in the Old Testament, and that's actually who the true Israel is. No, he, he doesn't say that. You can't make the text say that. It says, I will build my church, this new body of redeemed believers from all on the globe. And so we praise God for that. So now we come to it. And I'm a little scared. I'll be honest with you. I'm a little scared, but we come to it. And I'm going to do the best I can. Three different beliefs upon who the identity of the Israel of God is. The first position is this. The first position is that the Israel of God is the Jewish nation, even in unbelief. The preferred translation of chapter 6, verse 16 would sound something like this. And all who will conform to this standard, peace be upon them, and mercy also upon the Israel of God. Now, before you reject that view out of hand too quickly, allow me to offer some reasons why this view may be seen as favorable. I'll let you in on a little secret. I don't hold this view, but I can understand why. And that's one thing I tried to do as I approached this topic, was I tried to kind of leave my bias, which, okay, look, I have biases, right? I'm Jewish, okay? I, I know I have biases about this topic. But at the end of the day, I do my best to set those biases to the side in order to deal with the text. And I really do hope I do that, and I do a fair job to all views that are involved here. So let's do that here with this one. So what's in favor of this view? Well, number one, this is a grammatically possible translation of the original text. It is. You can translate it this way. This translation also recognizes God's everlasting covenantal uh, covenantal love rooted in his, the biblical word chesed, his loving kindness, and his rachamim, or his tender mercies that we see about in the Hebrew scriptures, the Old Testament, and and they're not being exhausted due to the failure of Israel to be faithful even to the present day. And you don't have to turn there, but I'm going to give you three different verses, and I'll read them for you. I'll give you the references if you want to check them out later. Or if you're if you're good in your sword drills, I guess you can move really quick. And if you've got a phone, I guess all you got to do is you can just do that. So whatever you like. But Deuteronomy chapter 7, verses 7 through 8 says this. God speaking to a specific nation that we call Israel, that the Bible calls Israel, at a specific time. He says to this specific nation... For you are a people holy to the Lord your God. The Lord your God has chosen you to be a people for his treasured possession. Out of all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. It was not because you were more in number than any other people that the Lord set his love on you and chose you. For you were the fewest of all peoples. But it's because the Lord loves you and is keeping the oath that he swore to your fathers that the Lord has brought you out with a mighty hand and redeemed you from the house of slavery from the hand of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. I'm sorry, that's Deuteronomy 7, verses 6 through 8. Now, we here at this church, and I believe that this is the most safe way to approach reading any passage of Scripture, is to seek to apply a consistent, what we call grammatical, historical way of interpreting. That is to say... We interpret the Bible based on the grammar that was used at the time. And and let me just also let you know a little secret. There is no Gnostic secret to knowing Hebrew or Greek, okay? When you're reading your English translation, right, with some exception for some more trickier passages, which knowing the original languages can help shed some light on it, what you're reading is 
pretty much what you have in the original language, okay? So this has nothing to do with, I've got a silver bullet because I know Hebrew or I know Greek. This is just reading the text and seeking to apply a consistent way that all of us in here, if we were speaking in our own historical context, we would mean to be understood. If I was talking about my family and said, my family and I are going to Chick-fil-A, obviously not today because it's Sunday, but we're going to go to Chick-fil-A for lunch on Monday, right? You would not have the liberty then to say, well, because Mike also sees us as his Christian family, he's going to take us all out to Chick-fil-A Monday afternoon. No, of course not. I have a specific referent in mind. These guys, as much as I would love to take everybody to Chick-fil-A, I don't have that kind of bank account, okay? So you get what I'm saying, right? There's a specific referent that I have in mind, and that is this family, even though we are all a Christian family. And so there has to be here in the mind of the original author, based on all the contextual clues that we get from the first five books of the Bible, that this is a specific ethnic group of people. Neither I nor you nor anybody else has the right to go back now and spiritualize this people and say, well, that's not really Israel. That's That was only the faithful of Israel. Well, I don't see that in the passage. I see in the passage that I chose you. And if you continue to read on, you realize God chose them, even though, with all due respect, they were going to be complete spiritual knuckleheads. I mean, can I say that? I mean, we have have the testimony of it in the Old Testament. And there are many unbelieving rabbis who would agree with me on that exact point, just as we would, right? They did not take advantage of the grace that God had bestowed upon them in choosing them. But that wasn't enough for God to jettison them. Why? Well, we looked at the Torah, which is the first part of the division of the Old Testament. Let's look at the Nevi'im, or the prophets. In Zechariah 2, 8-9, through 9, this is after the exile. It says, For thus said the Lord of hosts, after his glory sent me to the nations who plundered you. The nations, the Goyim, plundering who? Am Yisrael, the people of Israel. It doesn't get any clearer than that. Behold, I will shake my hand over them, and they shall become plunder for those who serve them. Then you will know that the Lord of hosts has sent me. Why? And I missed this part. My eye jumped it. For he who touches you touches the apple of his eye. You got to deal with the text. It says that about a often stiff-necked and rebellious people. Now, is there some overlap with us as believers? Is there an application that can be made? Of course there is but not to the rejection of the original referent. By the way, that's not progressive revelation. We talk about how God progressively reveals things over time. You can't progressively reveal something to destroy the foundations that you're building upon. That's not progressive revelation. That's altering revelation. That's, as far as I'm concerned, that runs the risk of being theological theft. This, this is the same example I give to all my students when we go through, you know, you ask, you ask a student in a Bible school, with all due respect to all my former students, I love all of you, <laughs> if you ever watch this, right? A lot of them, I'd say, what's your, what, what's your life verse, right? Well, my life verse is Jeremiah 29, 11. And what do I say? What does it say? For I know the plans I have to prosper and give you a hope and a future. You find it on all kinds of Christian paraphernalia. They don't have Family Christian down here anymore, but if you go on cbd.com, you'll find it on planners. You'll find it on graduation cards. It's all over the place. I said, great. That, that, that's a beautiful verse. What does it mean? And they usually would go, well, you know, they kind of hem haw a little bit. Because it seems clear to them, right? So they say, well, I think it means that no matter what comes my way in life, God will be faithful to me. And he'll make sure nothing, no, nothing ever ultimately comes, comes wrong, you know, comes to me and harms me or something like that. I say, that's interesting. So, because that's not what Jeremiah 29, 11 says. You got to look at the whole context. It's about a specific returning a specific group of people from exile, right? So you, you don't have the right to steal that Now, is there an application there of God's faithfulness that just as he's been faithful to Israel, he'll be faithful to the church? Absolutely. Amen and amen. But you can't do that and be consistent with a proper way to read the text. And that proper way is the way that I think God just wants himself to be understood. Deuteronomy 29, 29, right? The secret things belong to the Lord. The things he's revealed to us are for us and for our children, by the way, written to Israel, that we would walk in them. It's not right to now say, psych, I wasn't really talking about you guys. I was talking about a future spiritual group. There was, there, there was an expectation upon that people. So you got to root it in that. And then Psalm 135, 3 to 4, Praise the Lord, for the Lord is good. Sing to his name, for it is pleasant. For the Lord has chosen Jacob for himself, Israel, as his own possession. So from the writings now, the Ketuvim, 
the third division of the Hebrew scriptures, we have the same banjo, one no banjo, right? This is for a specific group of people. Thirdly, consider the way Israel is even just used in the scriptures in general. Just that name, Yisrael, the way it's used. We first see it in Genesis 32, 28, where God, the angel of the Lord, specifically says to Yaakov Jacob, after wrestling with him all night, remember, he says, I won't let you go until you bless me. And so what does the angel respond with? No longer will your name be Jacob, the man told him, but Israel, because you have fought with God and with men and have prevailed. That's fundamentally what the name Yisrael means. El is the name of God. Sarah is a verb which can mean a number of different things, but in this context, it means to strive or to contend against, which I actually personally believe that that kind of highlights the personal struggle that Israel has had with her God as a nation, even to 2023. But I digress. So that's the first mention of the name. And then it gets extended to all of the 12 sons and would then become the tribes of Jacob, leading to both an ethnic and a national distinction. Why do I say ethnic? Well, in Exodus chapter 1, verse 19, we see that the Hebrew women are referred to as what? Hebrew women from within those people that came down from Canaan to Egypt in Exodus 1, 7. The, the sons of Jacob, the tribes of Israel. It's also used as a national designation when the nation as such is uh, birthed and formed on Sinai in Exodus 19. So therefore, this term Israel is used ethnically. Most of the time it's used ethnically, but it can also have an extension to those of the nations who join themselves to this nation, foregoing a previous national identity, though they may not be ethnically connected to Israel, they forego that in order to join themselves to Israel's God. We have this with who? Somebody who's in the line of our Messiah, Ruth, right? Ruth chapter 1, verse 16, your people, Naomi, will be my people. Your God will be my God. And so she becomes subsumed then as a Moabite, as a Moabite right? One of the great enemies of Israel becomes subsumed into the nation of Israel herself and becomes one who's in the line of our Messiah. Now, one thing I thought was interesting, especially when I became a believer and started to actually read through the Old Testament, because most people wrongly would assume like, oh, you have a Jewish background. Yes. Oh, you must know the whole Old Testament. And I'm like, no, I did not go to yeshiva. I did not. I was not Orthodox, right? I was, I was, I was very much very secular, right? And very liberal as, as, as a Jewish person. And one thing that struck me was I don't really see the word Jew a whole lot in the Old Testament until we get to a certain point, right? So where's the rise of this term Jew? Well, after the exile into Babylon, you have one tribe that comes back in more predominance than any other tribe. And it's not Issachar, right? It's not Zebulun. It's Yehuda, right? Or, or, or Judah. Yehuda is, is, it comes from the word praise, right? So Yehudim are Jews. These are the people who come back to the land after the exile because they were most prominent. If you want an example of this in your Old Testament, good place to go is the book of Esther, right? The book of Esther is, is basically completely, it's all Jews for the most part. And then in Ezra chapter one, verse five, note this. It says, then rose up the heads of the father's houses of what? Of Judah and Benjamin and the priests and the Levites, everyone whose spirit God had stirred to go up to rebuild the house of the Lord that is in Jerusalem. Therefore, the name Israel becomes over time synonymous with the Jewish people, and therefore what we would call in the New Testament the Jewish nation. Note, once again, it is never used in reference to an amalgamation of other nations that still maintain a national identity but still call themselves Israel, or a special spiritual Israel in which there is no ethnic or national identity for Israel in the Old Testament. I love, this is one of my favorite prophecies of, of, of Messianic prophecy, we might say, or the impact of Messiah's ministry in this world. And it's in Isaiah 19, 24 to 25. And notice what the prophet here says. He says, in that day, Israel will be the third with Egypt and Assyria, a blessing in the midst of the earth, whom the Lord of hosts has blessed, saying, blessed be Egypt, my people, and Assyria, the work of my hands, and Israel, my inheritance. So we have a time coming in the future in which other nations are joined to God. God calls them my people. This is similar to what we see in Hosea. I will call those who are not my people, my people, speaking of the Goyim or the Gentiles. Paul quotes that then in Romans 11 in reference to the all-encompassing work of Messiah, not just for the Jews only, but also for the Gentiles, as Paul says in Romans chapter 3. This is part of the promised plan of God. But notice something here. There's still a dis ethnic distinction here, isn't there? Israel, 
Egypt, and Assyria. Funny how that works. Now, by the time we get to the New Covenant writings or the New Testament, this word Israel is used about 70 times in the New Testament. And in almost every occurrence, almost every occurrence, and there's three that we're going to look at this morning, hopefully, God willing, there is no debate about who is in mind, and that is indeed the ethnic religious nation of Israel. Where do we see some of the trouble from our vantage point today in interpreting it? We see it in the Apostle Paul. And mind this about the Apostle Paul. Right? Remember, Peter says in 2 Peter 3.16 that unwise and unstable men have twisted the words of Paul as they do with the rest of scriptures, because there are some things that Paul taught that what? Were difficult to understand. And actually, me and Sarah were having this talk, and we both lamented, like, sometimes we just wish it would just come out and say it plainly, right? But that's not how God inspired Paul. That wasn't his personality. That's not how he spoke to the people. So it is incumbent upon us, then, to do our work in order to discover what's actually being said here. But just to keep that in mind. And honestly, in those three cases I mentioned, where there is debates, there are convincing reasons to reject the idea that Israel was just a shadow of a greater New Testament reality, but more on that later. Now, as we, as we looked at for this view, to remind us again that this is the Jewish nation unbelief, here's what's against this view, and I'll try to make this quick. Although this translation is provided as possible that I gave you, it is improbable. And why? Well, quite frankly, see my message from last week at the end. But just by way of reminder, who's the nature of the referent here? What does the text say? It says, those who will walk in step with this rule, or as many as will conform to this standard, this kane, where we actually get our word canon from, like canon of scripture. All those who are falling in line with the standard just explicated, which is what? Verse 14, boasting in the cross, living in light of the new creation reality. And so therefore, God gives a blessing upon this referent. Peace, emphasize, shalom, irene, peace, be upon them. The true state that accompanies all true followers of Jesus and all true followers of Jesus alone, by God's grace alone, through God-gifted faith alone, in Christ's completed work alone. And that's quite honestly, I'm convinced that's the only way Paul would even use this kind of language, right? He's pronouncing a benediction, we might even say an eschatological peace, right? This peace is yours unto eternity. And mercy. And that's added to that benediction, and 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 just by the way the Greek is written here, I'm, I'm convinced that it's, it's, it's kind of more like a list, like one thing is kind of following from another. These are all related to one another. So you can't come in now and say, well, the Israel of God, that's, that's, a separate, that's a separate group that's getting mercy for something totally different. No, these are all connected together. Such mercy is only the inheritance, only the inheritance. I want to make sure you guys hear me here. Only the inheritance of those who have been made recipients of mercy by the all-merciful God through faith in Messiah. So the final verdict on the first view while it includes some truth, it cannot be justified from the passage itself. And if you cannot justify it from the passage itself, then you or I do not have the right to go try to find a way to make other passages somehow fit in order to make it work for whatever our preferred theology might be. We can't do that. And so let's move on to the second one. The second one is the Israel of God as the church made up of Jewish and Gentile believers. So get a deep seat in the saddle because here we go. The preferred translation of chapter 6, verse 16 on this point might sound something like this. And in fact, I'm quoting from the New International Version. If you have an NIV here, you'll be following along just fine. Peace and mercy to all who follow this rule, and then there's a dash, to the Israel of God, right? So what's going on there? The Greek connective word, it's called a kai, okay? It looks like a K-A-I in English language. Although in vast amounts of occurrences in both the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Old Testament, and the New Testament, even though in the vast majority of cases it's usually translated as and or also, adding to, it could be also used to restate or equate one thing to another. So in other words, you're adding a connective just to add a different emphasis on the person you're talking to. So I might, I might say something like, using my family as an example again, meet, meet my wife, who is my wife, and my children's mother, Sarah, right? I'm basically saying the same thing about the same referent. I'm just putting a different, a different nuance, right? Trying to get a different, different angle of it. Now, some, and, and I, I'm quoting here to some degree, uh, theologian O. Palmer Robertson's book, The Israel of God, 
in which he cites a portion of a benediction that's usually recited in the synagogue as proof of this view, because he holds to the view that this is the church of Jewish and Gentile believers. There was this the, the, this, this benediction, they were called the Shemone Esle, or the 18 benedictions, it's called today the Amidah, where faithful Jews will go into the synagogue and pray these prayers on a daily basis. And so, following Robertson's thinking, and this is possible, it is possible, following Robert's thinking, that what Paul is doing here is he's taking that, that statement of benediction and applying it to the church. So, allow me to demonstrate. The benediction goes like this, sim shalom, which means bestow peace. That's our word, peace, sim shalom. Tova uvracha, so goodness and blessing. Chaim, life, chain, grace, vachesed, loving kindness or, or mercy, or no, loving kindness. And then varachamim, which is and mercy, right? Aleinu valko Yisrael amecha, upon us and upon all Israel. Well, obviously, the group that's speaking there is what? It's Israel. They're the ones who are praying this prayer. So basically, the person is saying, peace and mercy and other things upon us and upon all Israel. Okay, well, you're, it's kind of redundant, right? But it's to the point that it's not just for us, but Israel, wherever she may be. So that's the first thing in favor of this view. The second thing in favor of this view is that really it does kind of fall in line quite nicely with the basic tenor of Paul's theology in the book of Galatians. I mean, think about it for a second. If you go back and look at some of the previous verses, what does Paul do? Well, he downplays the place of circumcision and thereby adherence to the law of Moses as a distinguishing mark for Israel and the Christian church. Notice, and if, if you can, you can go back with me to Galatians chapter 2, verse 3 to 4, where Paul says this, But not even Titus, who was with me, though he was a Greek, was compelled to be circumcised. But this was because of the false brothers secretly brought in, who had sneaked in to spy out our freedom, which we have in Christ Jesus, in order to enslave us. So Paul then goes on to call contempt on those who say that this defining mark for the Jewish nation is essential, is essential, sorry, I'm mixing Gentile and essential, essential for the church. Paul says in, in chapter 5, he says in verse 2, behold, I, Paul, behold, it's getting your attention, that's what it's meant to do, behold, I, Paul, say to you that if you receive circumcision, what? Christ will be of no benefit to you. If you put yourself under the law of Moses and continue to live in distinctions within the body of Christ as, well, I'm Jewish, so I've got to follow this and you've got to follow this too now, then you are cutting yourself off from the grace of Christ. Stop it, right? Don't do it. Knock it off. Think of that Bob, was that Bob Newhart skit? You know, the, he was like, you know, the psychologist, stop it, stop it, just stop it, right? Don't do it. You're going to run yourself into problems. Secondly, Paul refers to all believers in this letter quite explicitly, whether they're Jewish or Gentile, as the seed of Abraham, his spiritual children due to their union with Christ, the ultimate seed of Genesis 12, 1 to 3. And if you went back and looked at chapter 3, you can see Paul making this point. Specifically in verse 6, just as Abraham believed God and it was counted to him as righteousness, verse 7, so know that those who are of faith, those are sons of Abraham and so on and so forth from there, verse 9. So then those who are of faith are blessed with Abraham, the believer. And then thirdly, Paul makes a lot of point in this letter about destroying distinction within the body of Christ between disparate groups, as we see in Galatians chapter 3, verses 28 to 29, when Paul says, For there is neither Jew nor Greek, neither slave nor free man, no male and female, for you are all one in Christ Jesus. And if you belong to Christ, what? You are Abraham's seed, heirs according to promise. Furthermore, if we go outside of the book of Galatians, there are indeed those handful of verses that I mentioned previously that one could use to also support this line of thinking. And I'll read them for you now. Romans chapter 2, verses 28 to 29. Paul says this, For no one is a Jew who is merely one outwardly, nor is circumcision outward and physical. But a Jew is one inwardly, and circumcision is a matter of the heart, by the spirit, not by the letter. His praise is not from man, but from God. Furthermore, later on in Romans chapter 9, verse 6, Paul says this, But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for not all who are descended from Israel belong to Israel. And then finally, in 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 18, and I'm actually quoting from the Tree of Life version, which was a version that was specifically uh, composed by Messianic Jewish believers in order to provide a more Hebraic flair 
to the New Testament, because the New Testament, I would agree, is a thoroughly Jewish book in that, in that it's, it's thoroughly rooted in Hebraisms, and even the Greek that's being used in many cases is a Semitic type of Greek, and I'm not alone in that. Many scholars hold that same view. Not That doesn't make them right, by the way, but, you know, they spent a little bit of time. It's worth at least considering it. Consider physical Israel. Those who eat the sacrifices, aren't they partners in the altar? And what's the implication? If there's a physical Israel, then there's a spiritual Israel, right? And that affords with what Paul said in Romans. And then fourthly and finally, in favor of this view, this has been a major understanding and really the chief interpretation of the church throughout the history of the church. It was first interpreted this way that we know of anyway by Justin Martyr in the middle of the second century, about 160 AD, in his dialogue with Trypho, which is which was his basically apologetic work where he's where he's arguing with it with with an imaginary Jew. Basically, it was an interlocutor or an opponent that he created in order to say, like, you know, Jesus is the Messiah, right? And you need to believe in him if you're going to truly be a child of Israel. And then there's others throughout the history of the church. Chrysostom, John Chrysostom, the golden mouthed preacher, was one who held this view. He's very well held in much regard by people in the church. Even though we're not Roman Catholic here, I will just say this, this has been a majority opinion even amongst the Roman Catholic communion as well. It also carried over into the Reformation with men like Martin Luther and John Calvin and some more modern day commentators like G.K. Beale and Ritterboss. It's Henry Ritterboss, I believe. So, so that's what's in favor of this view, okay? It sounds pretty convincing, right? And let me also say this, that obviously the things that those who hold this view are touching on as I present them, and hopefully if you hold this view, I presented it fairly and accurately, there's a lot of truth to be commended in a lot of what was just said. Of course there is. It's coming from Scripture. So what goes against this view then? Is there anything that could be marshaled against this view? And I would argue that there is. And I would argue it can be kind of extensive, but I'll try to work my way through it somewhat quickly. Concerning the first part in favor of the view, although that Greek connective chi can be interpreted that way to say even or namely, there must be a compelling reason to do so in the face of the vast majority of ways it is just translated as a mere connective and, right, or also. And quite frankly, I am just not convinced that there is enough compelling reason to do so. I think the better translation is what we read together, what I read from the Legacy Standard, and that is, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. This would be the only place that the word Israel, which is the Greek way to say it, Israel, occurs in this letter. And it really does stretch credulity in my mind that Paul would introduce such a bombshell shift in an ending benediction, resulting in a massive shift away from how this word is used in the Hebrew Scriptures, as I've already outlined. In other words, if you're going to make an equation that the church is now Israel, it, it just it stretches my ability to believe it, to say, well, I'm going to do it at the end of a letter that's written as a benediction. I'm going to make this major theological point when the vast majority of cases, the word Israel is used to refer to what? An ethnic group of people. And so I don't buy it for that reason. It's, it, it, by the way, it, it's an allowable translation. It is. I just don't buy it. This was the only completed scripture, mind you, of the people at this point. Romans wasn't even written yet, okay? And two-thirds of Paul's usage of the word Israel, where does it occur? It occurs in Romans, 11 times actually, 11 of the 17 times he uses it. Furthermore, in that benediction I quoted called the Amidah, although it's believed to have originated in the 5th century BC, so about 500 years before Paul's writing, it didn't come into its final form until when? That fateful destruction of the temple in AD 70. And even a 19th benediction was added in the 1st and 2nd century AD. <laughs> Galatians, by the way, was written 20 years prior to the destruction of the temple. So therefore, even though it's possible, we cannot know with certainty whether or not Paul would have had that benediction in mind, or if this part of the benediction was even in this form in the days of Paul. Even one of the scholars I quoted, G.K. Beale, even at, who advocates for that position, even admits that himself. Secondly, the basic tenor of Paul's letter that those who advocate for this position would cite as evidence— I'm just going to be honest, it can be agreed upon by those who adopt the other two options as well. Therefore, it can't be used as evidence against them. I, I myself, I don't hold this view, but I still agree that circumcision truly doesn't matter for those in Messiah, while it still remains a potential distinguishing mark for those of Jewish extraction. If you go to Acts chapter 16, you don't have to go there if you don't like, but I'm going to read this to you. Acts chapter 16, verses 1 to 3. Listen to how Paul deals with Timothy, just for a moment. Now Paul also arrived at Derba and at Lystra. And behold, a disciple was there named Timothy, 
the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but his father was a Greek. And he was well spoken of by the brothers who were in Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted this man to go with him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews I was like, ouch, who were in those parts. For they all knew that his father was what? A Greek. Well, hang on a second there, Paul. You're raising that wall of partition here. You're circumcised him. He should accept him as a Christian. Only Paul doesn't do that. That might come from our theology that's uncomfortable with the fact that Jewish people may still remain ethnically Jews within the body of Christ, but it's not from the passage itself. We have evidence, therefore, that even though circumcision is not a defining mark for anybody as it comes to salvation, there were times where it would be used as a defining mark within the body of Christ to show that Jews do believe in Jesus, which is one of the reasons why I myself still identify as a Jew. Number one, I can't help it. I was born into it. Number two, it is a great testimony to Israel to show them that he's not just the Messiah of the Gentiles. You know what I was told growing up by my Hebrew school teacher? When I asked, who's the Messiah? What is a Messiah anyway? I was told, well, we're waiting for the Messiah to come. Christians, i.e. Gentiles, or Catholics, I mean, in, the Jew in many Jewish minds, it's hard to even separate the three. They believe that the Messiah is already here. We're just waiting for him to come. He's not the Jewish Messiah. Well, why is that? Well, he didn't fulfill the promises. Well, how so? There's no peace for Israel. Now, I wonder, where would they get that kind of thinking from reading the Hebrew Bible? Oh, I don't know, maybe because it's all over the place. There's no peace for Israel, and there's no peace in the world. Isn't the Messiah supposed to usher in world peace? This, is one of the, this still remains one of the great objections that Jewish people will have against the gospel. And so, how much better is it to go identifying as a Jew and say to those the shalom he brings is in the heart. It changes from the inside out. What you're looking for for the first coming, we're looking for as the second coming. He is coming to redeem the world. He is coming to redeem Israel and to save her. He is coming to make things right in this world so that there's no more sin like this Christmas song we sing almost every year. Far as what? The curse is found. Jesus is going to touch the ground and make sure that righteousness rules in all lands. Secondly, all believers indeed are spiritual children of Abraham. You know that Abraham had more children ethnically than just Isaac and Jacob, right? This is, this is part of Paul's point in saying that you are all spiritual children of Abraham, even though you're Gentiles, because the children of Abraham is not just about ethnic descent. It's those who are of faith. God makes them children of Abraham. You can be a spiritual child of Abraham, who, by the way, lest you may feel like you may tend towards jealousy, you have an infinitely better place in Messiah than any unbelieving Jew could ever have. Had this conversation yesterday. Even if all of Israel was back in the land, and yet they had not Messiah, they're still going to hell. Why? It's not because they're Jews. It's because they have sinned, just like you and I did before God graciously saved us. That's all. That's all. We are spiritual children of Abraham from the Jews and from the Gentiles. And by the way, I won't, I won't read it because I'm running out of time quicker than I thought, but in Romans chapter 4, verse 11 to 12, you can look that up. Paul doesn't erase Jewish identity or even individual Gentile identity in the body of Christ, which is part of what indeed gives it its beauty. It gives it its beauty. And then thirdly, there are truly no distinctions as it regards salvation in the body of Christ in keeping with 3, 28 through 29. If somebody says to me, well, you can't say that God solves a plan for the Jews because Galatians 3, 28 to 29 says uh, there's no Jew or Gentile. Okay, there's no male or female either. So where's your rainbow flag? Where's your transgender flag? Huh? No more gender? Slave and free. <laughs> I don't know, but when I look at the world scene, I see a lot of slaves still. And in fact, back in Paul's day, there was. That's what he says to Philemon, doesn't he? Receive him back not only as a slave, but as a brother. And thereby, I would argue, sowing the seed for the eventual abolishment of slavery within that system. But that's a different ball game and a different point. My point is this, is that you cannot make that text say, there is no more future plan for Israel because everybody's the same in Christ. 
It's a soteriological discussion that's going on in Galatians 3, not a discussion about future promises for a national group of people. Stop it. And by the way, if anybody here would hold that view and, and, and think somebody like me holds that view, that's being dishonest. I can't say it any more clearly than I'm saying it right now. There is no to say. So I agree with all those points. Ergo, you just took the wind out of the sails of that argument in favor for it. So here, let's look at a few. Let's look at some of these verses, though, the three verses in particular. So I invite you, I will ask you if you're able to go to Romans. And let's look at some of these verses in context. Romans chapter 2, we'll start there. Sorry, okay, I got the right ribbon that time. I put these ribbons in my Bible beforehand, so I'm not doing quite as much moving back and forth. So Romans chapter 2, rereading it for you. For he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, nor is circumcision that which is outward in the flesh. But he is a Jew who is one inwardly, and circumcision is that which is of the heart by the spirit, not by the letter. And his praise is not from men, but from God. So ethnic Jew versus spiritual Jew, potentially a Gentile Jew. Is that what's going on here? Well, if we're using our consistent grammatical historical hermeneutic, all we have to do is jump back up to verse 17. And how does Paul begin talking to this segment of his audience? Which, by the way, the background to the book of Romans, the Jewish believers were just starting to trickle back into the city as a result of being exiled under the governor of the city. If I got that right. I think I got that right. Well, anyway, they were exiled, all right? They were kicked out of the city, and they come back in. And now the reason, one of the reasons why Romans is written is to help the Gentile contingent that had grown and predominated at that point. What do we do with the Jewish contingent that's now coming back in? How are we to understand them? So in Galatians, um, Galatians, Romans 2, 1 to 16, Paul is primarily dealing with the Gentile element within the body there. But look at verse 17. But if you bear the name Jew and rely upon the law and boast in God. And he goes on to say, and this is what you find your legacy and your heritage in. We follow Torah. We are Jews. And therefore, we've got a leg up on the pile. If that's your thinking, Paul says, then why do you do things contrary to the Torah itself? You call yourself a Yehudi. You say you're part of the Yehudim, the Jews, the people of praise. And yet you don't act like a person of praise. You act like a pagan. You act like one to whom God has never given you commandments. So we can see clearly from the context, Paul is not now saying to Gentile believers, you're a spiritual Jew. That's violating the context. The context says very clearly, he is not a Jew who is one outwardly, which is why the English Standard Version adds, and I think it's accurate, he is not a Jew who is merely one outwardly. You, you could boast and blind the nation of Israel all you want, but unless this changes, none of that matters in the eyes of God. And then look at verse, chapter 3, verse 1. Then what advantage has the Jew, or what is the value of circumcision? So who's he still talking about here? He's talking about the nation of Israel. He's talking about Jews who, boast, who are boasting in their ethnic identity, those who are boasting in their ability to keep the law of God and thinking they got a leg up on the pile. He is not extending this out to Christians, all of them, to say, well, you're a Jew now, and so therefore now you have all the promises that were originally given to the nation in the Old Testament. That's theological robbery. The true person of praise amongst the people of praise, a true Yehudi amongst the Yehudim, is the one who has been converted inwardly and not merely circumcised outwardly. Moving on, Romans chapter 9, verse 6. Do we have an ethnic Israel versus a spiritual Israel here? Kind of the same discussion. Well, let's look at verses 1 to 5. I am telling the truth in Christ. I am not lying. My conscience testifies with me in the Holy Spirit that I have great sorrow and unceasing grief in my heart. Why? For I could wish that I myself were accursed, separated from Christ for the sake of whom? My brothers, my kinsmen, according to the flesh, who are Israelites, to whom belongs the adoption as sons and the glory and the covenants and the giving of the law and the temple service and the promises. Please, somebody in here tell me where in the Old Testament God extended this to the Amorites or the Moabites or the Hittites or the Jebusites or the Girgashites or the Canaanites or any other ites you could possibly think of. One group of people. And if that causes your feathers to be ruffled, just think about this. You were chosen. Did you deserve to be chosen? Did you deserve to be redeemed from all your sins? Of course not. So 
Why is the playing field changed now that we're talking about Israel? It shouldn't. But for some reason, within the Christian church, it has a tendency to do that. And there's a whole history of sadness as a result of that. Whose are the fathers and from whom is the Christ according to the flesh who is God over all, blessed forever? Amen. Now, 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 Paul here makes a disjunctive here, and he says, but that's all true. Paul's basically saying, look, that's all true. That's true of the nation of Israel. That's true of my fellow Jews, okay? God has called them and set them apart for a specific purpose. He's given them even the Messiah himself by which you Gentile believers have come to faith and become participants in the new covenant blessings. But it is not as though the word of God has failed, for they are not all Israel who are descended from Israel. Who are we talking about here? Those who are descended from Israel. What's Paul's point? Just like with the spirit, just like with the true Jew versus false Jew, we've got a true member of Israel who acts like a true Israelite versus somebody who's merely an Israelite, an Israelite in name only, an Eno, I don't know how you'd say that, but you know, an Israelite in name only who is not actually following the God who has called him or her to himself in covenantal faithfulness. They're disobedient. In fact, you need to look no further than John's gospel itself. John chapter 1, verse 47. Listen to what Jesus says about Nathanael. Jesus saw Nathanael coming toward him and said of him, Behold, an Israelite indeed, in whom there is no deceit. Is it possible that Jesus is employing the same type of thinking? Here's a true Israelite. Here's a true person of the nation of Israel who isn't just Israelite because his mother's Jewish or his father's Jewish. Or because he grew up in the temple, he had his bris and his bar mitzvah. No, he's, he has been made a true Israelite from the inside outward. That's all Paul is saying in Romans 9 through 6. I had an extended discussion here for the sake of time in Romans 10 11, trying to address maybe any kind of, any kind of objections to that. But I'm going to move on here to get to the final passage that I quote in terms of three trouble passages, and that's 1 Corinthians 10, 18. Physical Israel versus implied spiritual Israel. Now, the passage in 1 Corinthians 10, 18, if you read it, 1 Corinthians 10, 18, that is, it's comparing flesh and blood Israel and their practices of staying away from associating with idolatry to what the church was similarly called to. Now, true, at the beginning of 1 Corinthians 10, Paul refers to the, those that came out of Exodus in Egypt as our fathers, right? And that's obviously being applied to a Gentile church that had no ethnic connection to Israel. But I think that in light of every single other way the name Israel is used, it seems more likely that just as Abraham is a spiritual father to all those who believe, so that these were spiritually connected to Christians as an example. Paul actually says these things happen to them as an example, that you wouldn't walk in the same way that they would. So it seems more probable, considering the predominance of how Israel is used in the New Testament, that these indeed were spiritual forebearers, and Paul is using them as a warning. And just as a bonus... 2 Corinthians 3, 7, 3, 13, 2 Corinthians eleven twenty two, 22, Ephesians 2, 12, all of those references refer to ethnic Israel. And I think now that I think about it, what I'm going to do next week, my extended discussion on Romans 10, 11, on the use of Israel, I'm going to bring it into next week. So stay tuned. We will deal with it next week. I'm just looking at the time and I'm, I'm running short. And then fourthly, popularity and or years something is taught doesn't mean that it's true. It doesn't mean that it's true. You ought to say amen, because I'm going to tell you what. If time something taught meant it was true, then Rome's got us all beat. 1,500 years. 2,000 in their county, but I'm going to count from Gregory the Great or Leo the First, because I think that's more appropriate. Since, since the Pope is not Peter's, he's not sitting on Peter's throne, especially not this Pope. Oh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> sorry. And we know some of our Knights of Columbus friends who would agree with that. So my point is this, is that this teaching, remember, it didn't come until about 160 AD with Justin Martyr, okay? Now, you could read in the Apostolic Fathers, Epistle of Barnabas, some of these other, some of these other extra-biblical works within that, the close of the New Testament, the beginning of the, 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 the Apostolic period in that period. You can read some of these post-Apostolic Fathers, and yeah, unfortunately, there is quite a bit of disdain for the Jewish people within its pages. And it, it, it's, kind of a, it's kind of a messy kind of history, and I'll try to share some of that with you here right now. As the Jewish element of the church became less, okay, 
There was a council that took place, we believe, around 90 AD in a town called Yavna, where I mentioned the Shimon Esle earlier, the 18 benedictions, where that 19th benediction was added. You know what it was added for? To cast a curse upon all those who were the quote-unquote believers, right? The Jewish Christians within their midst, who still met in synagogues. And so you have an increasing antagonism from Israel and from the rabbinic Jews, who, by the way, if you talk to a rabbi today, they will see themselves as heirs of the Pharisees. Okay, that is the group that won out in the end. So rabbinic Judaism, their spiritual forebears are the Pharisees of the New Testament. Okay, as you have this growing element of disdain from the Jewish people towards the church, you have a reciprocating growing disdain from the Gentile church now, the predominantly Gentile church, towards the Jewish people. And as that began to dominate, that, that increase of Gentile influence over Jewish influence in the church, so too did the increase of, as Paul says in Romans 11, just would have hit a little bit differently if I actually went to Romans 11 this morning, but if you remember from Romans 11, Paul says to the Gentile believers, do not boast over the natural branches. The natural branches are the Jews. They have been broken off of the tree, and I know this may be a different interpretation than what you're used to hearing, but the only one that I think makes any sense, what is the nature of that olive tree? It is not the nation of Israel. It's the covenantal blessings and programs of God that the, uh, the Jews have been broken off from so that Gentiles could be grafted in. So that when I had a student say to me, oh, it sounds to me like, like Christian like Gentiles or second-class citizens. I said, absolutely not. I said, strike that from your mind. You exist to make the natural branches jealous. So they say, you say, you pray to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I do too. You quote the Shema. You know what the Shema is? Shema Yisrael, Adonai Eloheinu, Adonai Echad. That's Deuteronomy 6.4. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. That's from Deuteronomy. You can pray that as a Christian. They say, how can you do that? Because the Jewish Messiah has saved me. He's my Messiah. He's your Messiah. You don't get off easy because you're a Jew. But you will be saved if you repent and believe in his name. And about some of the people in church history, I'm just going to give you a couple examples. Unfortunately, these kinds of statements are legion. Chrysostom, the golden mouth preacher, who did say some very, and write some very wonderful things about the truth of the Christian faith. Listen to what he said about the Jews. Quote, the synagogue is worse than a brothel, a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ. 400 years after the death of Jesus. You wonder why the blood libel slant still exists? Or why when I was doing ministry for a Jewish Christian Jewish organization in Chicago, and the guy took one look at my shirt and said, you guys killed my savior. Old habits die hard, I guess. Just awesome because I say, I hate the synagogue. I hate the Jews for the same reason. That doesn't sound like a warm heart towards Paul's kinsmen according to the flesh, does it? That's not just boasting. That's murderous talk. And we had, we had this gentleman who was here just yesterday, just John Delancey guy. Even he attested to this. And by the way, just so you know, he doesn't follow the same eschatology that I do. And you know what he even said? He said there is a stark amount of silence on this very issue. Why? I asked him, I said, why? I won't get into the answer right now, but it it's, it's really is an enigma to some degree. I'm going to read a couple to you here, too, from Luther. And I love Martin Luther. And I so appreciate what he did for the Church of Christ and what God used him to do. But notice what he said. Now, this is, I'm going to, I'm going to give you two quotes from Luther, all right? One's from 1543. That was near the end of his life. And he's often excused because, oh, well, he was old, he was crotchety, cranky, and the Jews didn't believe in him, and it, it didn't follow the Reformation, and so he changed his attitude, he changed his spirit. Maybe a little bit. Luther said this in 1543, near the end of his life. But if you have to or want to talk with them, do not say any more than this. Listen, Jew, are you aware that Jerusalem and your sovereignty, together with your temple and priesthood, have been destroyed for over 1,460 years? Therefore, this work of wrath is proof that the Jews, surely rejected by God, are no longer his people, and neither is he any longer their God. This is in accord with Hosea 1.9, "'Call his name, not my people,' For you are not my people, and I am not your God. Maybe Luther should have read Hosea chapter 2. 
verse 14, where it says, Therefore, behold, I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak to her heart. Verse 17, so I will remove the names of the Baals from her mouth so that they will be remembered by their names no more. And in that day, I will cut a covenant for them with the beasts of the field, the birds of the sky, and I will make them lie down in security. And I will betroth you to me forever. Indeed, I will betroth you to me in righteousness and in justice, in loving kindness and in compassion. And I will betroth you to me in faithfulness. Then you will know Yahweh. Verse 23, and I will show her for myself in the land. Not spiritual Jesus. I will also have compassion on her who had not obtained compassion. And I will say to those who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. Pity Luther, who was so meticulous in so many ways, I guess on this issue, when the rubber met the road, he couldn't help but hold his hate back. He goes on to say, yes, unfortunately, this is their law. Truly a terrible one. They may interpret this as they will. We see the facts before our eyes, and these do not deceive us. So we are even at fault, and this is near the end of the tract, we are even at fault in not avenging all this innocent blood of our Lord and of the Christians, which they shed for 300 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, and the blood of the children they have shed since then, which still shines forth from their eyes and their skin. And just so nobody thinks that this was just said by somebody who was eventually corrupted because he was throwing a pity party and was angry like he was wont to be. 1514, these are letters to Spalatin, who was one of his fellow monks in the Augustinian order. 1517 is the nailing of the 95 Theses. Quote, I have come to the conclusion that the Jews will always curse and blaspheme God and his King Christ. For they are thus given over by the wrath of God to reprobation that they may become incorrigible. As Ecclesiastes says, for everyone who is incorrigible is rendered worse rather than better by correction. I mean, I thought that was all nations, by the way. We'll just reserve a special hatred for a certain group. And the only reason I'm mentioning these examples today is to make the point that these examples do indeed demonstrate how our biases can indeed affect the way we interpret texts of Scripture. They can. Just because it happened in time and for many years does not make it right. Yes, if you see somebody come along with a different theology that's escaped the notice of people for 2,000 years, okay, okay, then yeah, you should take a little bit stronger look at it, all right? But that doesn't make it wrong just because it's new. I get that a lot from people who say, well, the system of theology I hold to is only 150 years old. And I say, well, you got 200 years before mine. And in light of Rome, once again, 1,500 years. So who's quibbling over a couple hundred years? Is it Semper Reformanda or Semper Reformanda until I've got the theology I prefer and then I'll stop reforming? <clears throat> so the verdict on this view is even though there is much to be commended in this view, and there is, there's a lot of truth being spoken here. Ultimately, this view, I believe, is more fueled by one's theological predispositions than a proper exegesis of Scripture. Therefore, in spite of its truths, the ultimate answer must lie elsewhere. That is what I will cover next week. I don't know if that's much of a cliffhanger, but I will cover it next week. But in conclusion, where do we go from here, right? Where do we go from here, then, in preparation for next week? I have striven to provide a proper way to interpret Scripture from a properly grounded grammatical historical hermeneutic, giving an example that can be followed by any one of us in here. And by the way, let me just make a point here. You all know that I'm not, I'm not uh, shy about being emotional, and I can be very emotional. I want you to know that my emotion towards men like Christostom and Luther is in no way directed at anybody in here who would hold to a theology that's different than the one I would hold to. I am not looking at anyone in here like your Luther or, or Chrysostom or anybody else like that. Everybody is judged on their own merits as far as that goes. So just so that you're aware of that, it's just, there was, a, there was a scholar who said something to the effect of the pages of history that the Christian church is trying, that, that the Christian church has ripped out of their history books are the pages that the Jewish people can't forget. And, it's, and it, 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 it still is a major stumbling block. And I just don't think, especially in these days, we should be adding to that. 
I've also striven to make sure the purity of the gospel is upheld, despite being on the other side of many of those who would claim the gospel-centered or Christocentric ground and adopting even the second view. The gospel needs to remain pure. There's only one way of salvation. I say that to all of everybody in here. It's through Jesus Christ and through him alone. It's not through good works. It's not through your lineage. It's not through ethnicity. It's not through nationality. It's not through anything else but personal faith in Christ and in him alone. And you can only exercise that faith if God has gifted it to you. And so he's sovereign over salvation. That's it. That call goes out to everybody in this world. Repent and believe the gospel. And finally, I've striven to be honest with my own biases toward this subject. However, I hold that the final option we're going to look at next week is the right one, which says that the Israel of God is the remnant of Jewish Christians who are completely unified in every way with their Gentile brethren in Christ, showing that God will fulfill his promises to the patriarchs in that day in which, as Romans 11.25 says, all Israel will be saved. Or as Zechariah 12.10 says, I will pour out in that day on the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of supplication. And they will look upon, Yahweh saying this, they will look upon me whom they have pierced. And they will mourn. They will mourn. But that weeping will last for the night. The joy will come in the morning, the other morning, because God will indeed keep his promises just like he keeps his promises to you and to me. I do not hold to the position that God still has a plan for the Jews because I am a Jew. Rather, I am a Jew in spite of all the persecution we face as a people group for millennia because God has not abandoned his covenantal promises to his original chosen nation in keeping with the spirit-inspired words of Paul. There's a song that goes that's sung in many Jewish homes, especially now it's almost a, a note of rebellion Am Yisrael Chai, which means the people of Israel live. And I can add to that, Am Yisrael Chai, Vagam Ani Chai, the people of Israel live, and so also do I live. And praise God for his faithfulness. Because he's been faithful to the Jews, we can be assured that he will remain faithful to you and to me. Let's pray. <sighs> our Father and our King, you are an awesome God, a beautiful and glorious Savior. Where would any of us be without you? You have indeed torn down the wall of partition separating Jew from Gentile and have made us one new man in Christ in a beautiful unity that is fueled by the gospel of grace and by nothing else. And Jesus, you indeed are that gospel of grace. I am so thankful that you saved me and you did not allow me to remain in my unbelief, but that you restored me to yourself as you've done with all of my brothers and sisters in here who have repented and put their faith in Christ and him alone. We have done this only by your grace and mercy. And we love you and we praise you. I pray, God, that in spite of my, at times, passion, that the truth is not, was not clouded. And once again, Lord, I freely ask that if I have erred or said anything that is not in keeping with your word, please, Lord, open my heart to correction. Because at the end of the day, I don't want to be right. And I just I want you to be right. I want your truth to be upheld. So we love you, Lord. We thank you, and as we to sing this final song. All glory be to you, Lord Jesus Christ. All glory to Christ. And may you bring us back safely by your will next week. In Christ's name we pray.